My name is Loïc Lanlong, I'm a research associate at the University of Cambridge and I will talk to you about my poster on predicting protein-protein interactions. So I'm sure I don't need to convince any of you of the importance of proteins, uh, but maybe why do we want to use algorithms for PPIs? Um, one of the reasons is experimental tools such as yeast to hybrid um, have made great progress and recent initiatives attempted to map the proteome with little study bias but we are not yet at a point where they can map all possible interactions accurately. So the idea is to uh, use a pair of proteins and have some information about each protein and feed that into a model that can learn to recognize interacting proteins. And there has been a lot of models released along these lines over the past 20 years. Here are some, um, some examples. Early models focused on Bayesian methods, more recent ones rely on deep learning and it is great to have so many models, but at some point we need to know whether the imputed PPIs can be trusted. And it's, it's still all a bit confused. Um, the problem is reported performance scores often cannot be compared or replicated uh, due to proprietary data sometimes or inconsistent or flawed assessment methods. So what we need is a reliable way to compare PPI models, but also understand why models make vastly different predictions. So I'll just uh, throw in a couple of publications recently um, that have actually looked at benchmarking PPI prediction tools, which was long overdue, and, and they are very much welcome. Uh, but what we still need in something is something more scalable, which means authors would follow standardized best practices and we're not quite there yet. And also we still uh, need to understand why models make different predictions. So um, first we put together B4 PPI, which is uh, at heart, it's a training and testing sets. Uh, these are built to take into account some well-known pitfalls um, that are not always addressed. Um, and it's from intact, so it's professionally curated. It's using standardized ID. Uh, I'll mention a bunch of pre-computed features later. These are included for people who want to have a, a quick and dirty try. Um, it comes with recommended metrics. Um, it's open source on GitHub and it can easily be adopted to most um, model organisms. And once we have that, we can start diving into existing models to understand what happens. Um, there are two main approaches to predicting PPIs. Uh, the first one, perhaps the most intuitive one, is based on functional genomics information. So the idea is to uh, measure the similarity between pairs of proteins, and if you have enough similarity, then, then the probability of interaction is higher. Uh, the benefit is it's low dimension, uh, only a few features, and therefore you can use any standard machine learning models you may already be familiar with. On the other end of the spectrum, we um, have models relying on amino acid sequences alone. The information is, of course, a lot richer and less biased, but it's also much harder to handle. Here's an example of how to deal with that. I won't get into too much details, but happy to chat this through a bit further. It's called the Siamese network. All right, so focusing uh, on the uh, functional genomics based model first, it was interesting to note that actually they all perform roughly the same, which means using something sophisticated like XGBoost performs about the same as a logistic regression at the end of the day, which, which was really interesting. Um, and if we throw in uh, the sequence model, we can see that, yeah, the sequence model seems to perform better except at very low recall. But as we'll see in the next couple of minutes, uh, this comes with a, 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 a few uh, pitfalls. All right, so let's just put on something I, 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 I have mentioned, uh, which is protein level overlap. Um, our gold standard is a collection of protein pairs, let's say A with B, C with D, C with A, etc. Uh, and then we split these between training and testing sets all good. We obviously don't put the same examples in training and testing, but here we're working with pairs of protein. So although the pairs are different, the protein themselves can be shared between the two sets. So you can either have both proteins shared, which is total overlap, or just one or none at all. And if the algorithm can recognize the protein, then these can have serious consequences. Um, so first looking at the logistic regression, so FG-based, and it doesn't affect it at all. We can see it performs exactly the same for these subgroups. It may seem like a lot of effort for not much, but let's look at sequence models and we see that actually there is a big effect here and um, sequence models don't perform so well on new proteins. 
which, as you can imagine, has a lot of implications. Now, another thing that's quite important about protein networks is they are close to be scale-free, which means you have a few proteins with a lot of interactions called hubs and many proteins with few interactions, which we call lone proteins. And that has a lot of consequences biologically, and the assumption is it probably also has consequences on models. So to look at it, we made subgroups. Uh, so we looked at proteins between hubs, between hubs and uh, between a hub protein and a lone protein, or between lone proteins, and we s watched how different models perform on that. And that was really, really interesting because what we can see is that FG-based models, they do a lot better when hubs are not involved. It's completely the opposite with sequence-based models, which do a lot better when hubs are involved. Um, so that shows some form of complementarity. That's, that's, that's really nice. Why is that? It's actually quite coherent with how models learn, um, but I'll run out of time, so I'll just, um, I'll just have, let's just have a chat in the poster chat box and uh, to talk about that. All right, does it replicate to other organisms? Yes, it does. Exactly the same result on yeast. So can we train a model on a species to predict on another? Well, as expected from previous uh, from the results presented above, uh, before, sequence models not so much doesn't do well on new proteins. FG-based models do really well and basically the performance the same, which is also interesting. Few limitations. Um, didn't look at other approaches, the hierarchical nature of gene ontologies. Deep learning has been used successfully for cross species. Um, and yeah, uh, the impact of similarity. So I will finish just in time by thanking my collaborators and uh, have a chat in the chat box. Thank you.